Yes, thank you, Jens. Um, I'm Breach Nolan. I'm with the Washington Old Time Fiddlers Association. And we have Phil Williams, who is not related to, but married to Vivian Williams. Uh, <laughs> Stuart Williams, who has nothing whatsoever to do with them, except that sometimes they play music together. Oh, you're, he ha her mic's not on. He has the same birthday that, that, them. Oh, oh yeah, okay. It was on Thursday. Happy birthday. Um, okay, so we're going to race you through 200 years of fiddle music history in Washington State. We are starting in 1792. Two reasons. It's 200 years before 1992 when I came here, so for me it's really history. And the other reason is because George Vancouver was here with his ship Discovery, and on that ship he had a barrel organ. We had a PowerPoint with a beautiful picture of a barrel organ, but, you know, stuff happens. And so you can't see it, so you just have to picture it. It was on board his ship. The uh, English Royal Navy provided music for three things. One, to keep folks in time when they were doing repetitive tasks. Two, for entertainment, and three, for morale. And they sometimes hired fiddlers, but not for this journey. They had a barrel organ. And we have a list of the tunes, and Vivian is going to perhaps say some words, and if not, play a tune. Well, one of the tunes on that barrel organ was the tune known as Sailor's Hornpipe. Well, back in that day, it was called the College Hornpipe. And uh, it used to be that, that they did a... Um, a dance, a little step dance in a sailor costume. John Durang did a step dance in a sailor costume to that tune, and so they started got getting to be known as the Sailor's Hornpipe, and you've all heard this thing, I know. Also, the Popeye tune, I've been told. I don't actually remember, but it's a Popeye tune, if it sounds familiar. So we're going to skip ahead. That was 1792. Now we're going on to 1805. Lewis and Clark were on their way across the country, and music was so important to people as it is now, but even back then it was even more important because they didn't have iPods. So they brought musicians with them, and Lewis and Clark had two fiddlers with them. Cruzat was French-Canadian, and Gibson, who was American. And they he entered... He was American-Canadian. He was American-Canadian? <laughs> Okay. Oh. French American, he was from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, it wasn't Missouri then. Okay. Oh, that's right, it was Louisiana and it was French. Um, anyway, <laughs> they entertained themselves and the Native Americans. The Native Americans developed a very early taste for European music. They really enjoyed it and actually would come and ask the fiddlers to play for them. I have a couple of quotes out of the uh, Lewis and Clark journals about the Indians in eastern Washington who particularly love to hear that fiddling and see the, the men dance. This uh, first one is from um, the Walla Walla, this is, they were with the Walla Walla Indians near Umatilla, which is now in Oregon, from Clark's Journal. Soon after we landed, which was at a few willow trees, about a hundred Indians came from the different lodges, and a number of them brought wood which they gave us. We smoked with all of them, and two of our party, Peter Cruzat and Gibson played on the violin, which delighted them greatly. Now, on the way back the next spring, the Indians saw them coming, and they knew what to expect, and so they asked them to dance. Here's another quote. This is also, uh, well, this is near Walla Walla, and the uh, Chimnapom Indians that they mention are actually the Yakimas. 
A little before sunset, the Chimnapoms arrived. They were about a hundred men and a few women. They joined the Walla Wallas, who were about the same number, and formed a half circle around our camp, where they waited very patiently to see our party dance. The fiddle was played, and the men amused themselves with dancing about an hour. We then requested the Indians to dance, which they very cheerfully complied with. They concluded their dance until 10 at night, or they continued their dance until 10 at night. At 10 p.m., the dance concluded and the natives were retired. They were much gratified with seeing some of our party join them in their dance. Sounds like a great time. <laughs> okay, we're going to fast forward a little bit um, into the... 10s and 1820s, and there were fur traders here. And that was the big impetus coming out here was to be first in line for the beaver fur. There were um, British, Canadian, French Canadian, um, other folks, Americans came a little bit later. Stuart's going to tell you a little bit about the French Canadian fur traders. Oh, well, they mentioned uh, Pierre Cruzet from down in St. Louis. Uh, throughout that whole time period, the 1700s, uh, the middle of Canada and the upper Midwest there was being explored by the fur trappers who at that time in that area, the, the French Canadians, um, primarily, but then they began very quickly to intermingle and marry into the, the native tribes and uh, that use the term Métis for these cultures who, as, as Vivian mentioned, uh, took very quickly to the, to the uh, European-based fiddle music and uh, over time developed a, a very unique and very interesting and wonderful style of playing uh, the fiddle, and uh, continue to influence the Western Canadian and the Northwestern states to this day. And uh, besides being the first permanent fiddlers around the St. Louis area, they, uh, the first farm settlements, the first permanent settled settlements around the near Fort Nisqually and uh, French Prairie in Oregon were Métis communities uh, from the Red River area of Canada brought out to farm uh, to provide the uh, stores for, for the fur trade and for the soldiers at the forts. And, and one of the oldest and most popular universal tunes is called the Red River Jig. And I learned it from a man named Al DeLorme down in Oregon, who himself was Métis, uh, grown up in Montana. I'll do a little footwork here to it. Uh, After that, the first um, farmers, well, there were farmers around, but the settlers started to arrive on the Oregon Trail uh, in the 1840s or so. And we're going to merge like 20, 40 years of history here into one moment in time. And there were, you know, many, many fiddlers were sure among the settlers. Two of the well-known ones were Ezra Meeker was a fiddler and um, mentioned Hosiah. fiddle tunes. Hosiah Merritt. And Hosiah Merritt, who is also known as Uncle Sai and is the man for whom Mount Sai is named, was also a fiddler. And Vivian has some interesting things to say about that. Okay, well, this is another one of the uh, notorious, at least in my mind, fiddlers from the area. This is from 1862 at the wedding of Catherine Elizabeth Jane Maple. Is that enough first names for you? And Henry Van Assel. They got married on Christmas Day in a cabin down on the banks of the Duwamish River, right where the Boeing Company is today. And they had this big fancy dinner. And then after the dinner, 700 of Chief Seattle's Indian tribe, the Duwamish tribe, filed through the cabin to congratulate the bride and the groom. And then after that, they had a dance. And here's a quote from a description of the wedding by the bride's brother, John Wesley Maple. He said, 
Old Jake Lake was the fiddler on that occasion. He had only a few tunes at his command, and we danced them all before morning. Among them were the Arkansas Traveler, the King's Head, which is better known as Soldier's Joy, Fisher's Hornpipe, Unfortunate Dog, Gal on a Log, and The Devil's Dream. He had on an old shoe, which was not in its prime any longer, as the uppers had become loosened from the soles, and we saw the red stocking and the upper going up and down incessantly as the foot kept time to the music. And then he goes on to describe the dances. They did the Virginia Reel, Opera Reel, Threading the Needle, French Fours, Weaving the Wheat, which I suspect is Weevily Wheat and some others. Um, all that was lacking was that there was a scarcity of women. There were about but five among all the men. At about two o'clock in the morning, the bridegroom gave out and fainted away on the ballroom floor. The rest of us went on with the dance, which lasted <laughs> until about five in the morning. And then, at the same time that all this was going on, Chief Seattle and his tribesmen had a giant potlatch on the banks of the river, also in celebration of this wedding. Do you want to play Soldier's Joy? You going to play Soldier's Joy? Okay, we'll play one of the tunes. We're going to play the King's Head, which we usually call Soldier's Joy. And um, although Jake Lake was uh, the only fiddler at this occasion, one of the very common things that would happen would be that there would be fiddlers and no other instrumentalists, and so one fiddle would back up the other fiddle. So we're going to see what we can do about demonstrating that. All right, the king's head. fiddlers um, around here who's 92 and learned to play in eastern Washington when he was seven, so you can do the math, and he described this to me, this kind of playing as, you know, the two fiddlers wouldn't play together, but one would make some noise to go along with the other one. <laughs> okay, we're going to skip ahead again to the 1890s, and that's when the various gold rushes, there were a number of them in Alaska, hit, and a bunch of people came into Seattle, some of them stayed, some of them passed through. There was a lot of money in town at that point. There was a lot of music and entertainment. Um, Seattle Symphony got started around that time, uh, but there were also a lot of what are now known as vaudeville kind of theaters. And we have time to do a quick blast of a tune from that. Hot time. So this is the tune that was the number one on the hit parade at the Klondike Gold Rush. It's hot time in the old town tonight. <laughs> Thank you. 
from our perspective, one of the most important things to happen in the gold rush was that Alexander Pantages came from Greece and ended up in the Klondike, I believe it was, gold rush, and came back to Seattle and started a theater that ultimately uh, was the first of the Pantages theater circuit. And a man named Joe Panzareski, who's from North Dakota originally, ended up working, playing fiddle in the Pantages circuit. And Vivian knew Joe, so she. So we're we're moving forward in time. We're getting into the period of time where there were people that we actually knew and played with around. Right. So uh, Panzareski, uh, after he played on the Pantages out in this area, he went back to North Dakota, and then he got a job working for the railroad, which he did for I believe 45 years. And then when he retired, he started playing the fiddle again, and he got very active in the local old-time fiddle association scene, and that's where we met him. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, this is on. Uh, Joe was really one of our mentors. We did four, um, uh, four albums of him with uh, Voyager Recordings, one of which was selected by the Library of Congress for their select list. But uh, Joe came out of retirement when he saw Vivian playing on television in a... The, with the Evergreen Jubilee show in the late 60s, live and direct from KOMO-TV. And he called up, <laughs> found out there was fiddling going on, and within one year he was winning every fiddle contest inside. So there's one tune that is pretty well known among a lot of the old-time fiddlers now. It's uh, called St. Adele's Reel. I'm not sure what, where the origin of the tune is, but around here the origin is with him. And so... Um, it got very popular among a lot of the other fiddlers, so I'm going to play St. Adele's more or less the way I got it from Joe, and then Stuart is going to play it differently. You want to tell what you're going to do, or and then we'll, well just go continue? I, I also learned it from Joe, and then I also heard other fiddlers who had learned it from Joe who um, play it in their own, really their own style, and, and what happens with these old-time fiddlers, they usually grow up hearing a certain kind of music and a certain uh, approach to the fiddle, certain bowing rhythms, and then they encounter new tunes from other parts of the country, and they adapt those tunes to that style. And uh, Gil Kiesecker uh, grew up in east, southeastern Washington, San Antonio, was a wonderful old-time dance fiddler, and he played this tune. And Jim Evans, who's from Texas, played more of a, well, southwestern uh, and southern-influenced hoedown style, and, and I've sort of drawn from both of those. So. Um. so we'll do it my way, which is more or less Joe's way, and your way, which is... An yeah. amalgam of, you just play uh, by yourself and then of whatever. I come in and then maybe that's enough. Right. <laughs> or, or play it again. Let's, let's, I'll play it. You play it, and then we'll do some kind of silly duet on it. I know what'll happen. Okay. an example of what happens when fiddlers get together. They start playing music and wonderful things happen. 
And if we had our PowerPoint, we'd have a picture up right now of a bunch of different fiddlers that um, lived and still live here. There were many, many fiddlers here who came here, a lot of them, during, after, during the Depression, looking for work in the shipyards and also in World War II, looking for work in the shipyards. They came together and they had their own home styles with them and they played together and that's when this new style starts to develop. And I think um, Vivian and Stuart are going to talk a little bit more about that and give you some examples. Well, one of the uh, very important influences, uh, mu musical stylistic influence around here is from the Scandinavian community. And um, it's, well, we're going to play a tune that we don't really know where it came from. The Swedes think they wrote it. And uh, the oldest, the oldest version of it I've ever seen is some sheet music from about 1870. This is the Peekaboo Waltz. And the uh, Scandinavians call it Svensk Anna's Vals, and I think there's some other names for it as well. So I don't know who stole what from whom when, but uh, virtually all of the Northwest regional fiddlers play one version or another of this waltz, and most of them don't know anything about a Scandinavian connection. So, uh, uh, yeah, it, it was started out as a song it's, and with the peekaboo, I see you, you know, silly words to it. So we're going to play, we're going to do something with this. I'm not sure what. Yeah, I'm going to start out with some seconding again. And okay. this is based on a style that I learned from Sadie Gates, who's a third generation Norwegian-American from North Dakota. She grew up speaking Norwegian and playing Norwegian and American dance music uh, with her father and grandfather in North Dakota. And uh, so this is a tune she played, and this tune everybody played. And then we're going to switch off. Before that, we're going to play another tune, and then Warren Argo is going to join us. And before that, I wanted to just mention that in the 1960s, it seems like everyone was getting organized to do something. And uh, there was a man named Manny Shaw in Idaho who organized the Idaho Fiddlers um, Association. And it was really through him and that organization that the Washington Old Time Fiddlers Association got started and the Oregon Old Time Fiddlers Association in 1962 in the World's Fair. Phil and Vivian played there, and the Idaho Old Time Fiddlers came over and played there too. And Phil and Vivian have been playing around here since, I mean, who knows, forever. And they used to play for square dances in Seattle Center, and then they decided to organize folk life <laughs> and keep it all going. So there's been this continuous stream of fiddle music in this area since 1792, actually, probably before. It's just that we don't know. We, we can go back as far as 1792. And do you guys want to do Durang's okay. first time? Yeah. Uh, what versions? Oh, OK. Talk about the different yeah. versions. OK, I'll talk about talk the way about. I play. OK, Durang's hornpipe is one of these classic tunes, and it's in all those old 19th century collections. And those were actually, you know, taken down from somebody's playing in 1860 in Boston or thereabouts. So the way I play Durang, Durang's hornpipe is pretty close to the book version, except that I learned a little odd thing that I do in the second part, which is different. I, learned, I got it from Grant Lamb, who is a Canadian fiddler from Manitoba. And then uh, Stuart's going to play yet another version of it, and it's going to be interesting for Phil to go directly from one into the other because the courting is very different. 
uh, on the second part. So, yeah. So. Uh, we mentioned this intense, very, very big Scandinavian influence in Northwestern fiddling, as well as the, the French Canadian and Canadian in general. Another huge impact were the fiddlers out from Missouri in the central, up in the Midwest. And uh, the version I play, I first learned from Phil Simmons, who was an Oregon old time fiddler, just uh, raised in Eastern Oregon, played for square dances back in the 20s and 30s. Then I learned a version from Earl Willis, who was from Mineola, Missouri, just a little bit south of John White there. <laughs> and then picked up other bits and pieces here and there, and I just played a lot for dances, and we've had a lot of fun with it ever since. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna see what happens. Well, you're gonna go first. Then I'm gonna go, I'll go and then first, we'll do it together. and then or something. Uh, all right. <laughs> happening out here in the 50s and 60s and then in the late 60s the whole world changed again and people started moving around and all these college kids came out here and the coffee scene started the coffee house scene started and people started hanging out in town most of these fiddlers we've been talking about were rural they were based in rural areas a lot of this music was happening in homes and in grange halls and then in the late 60s and on into the 70s and up until today, the emphasis kind of shifted into the more the urban scene. And Warren Argo is in the audience. And he, did you bring your fiddle? Do you want to come up and say a few words? So Warren is well known in this area. And I'm sure you've all seen him down in the roadhouse if you've been in the roadhouse. And he is very famous in fiddle music. Very famous. Very yes. Well loved. Well, that, we'll see about that. I grew up in California, and I was influenced by some country fiddlers that lived in the San Joaquin Valley. Had very, very good. Uh, Ron Huey was a welder in Fowler, California, and one of the best fiddlers I ever knew. He creamed all the contests down there, but really, he just loved to play the hairy old, hairy old dance tunes, and it wound us all up. And we sort of had a diaspora where all the old time musicians down there went in different directions I wound up here and ran into Phil and Vivian fortunately very early in my arrival here and all the other things I was doing uh, the music was growing I heard how they played I had a lot of tunes in common with them and one thing that seemed to develop was an interest in dance and somehow that was the one little piece that was missing there was a I guess there was some dancing still going on but the sort of the neighborhood access stuff was yet to be found and somewhere in the 70s it caught on uh, I worked with a guy in the woods who knew some square dance calling and then uh, the band I played in went to Expo 74 where the little folk life festival that was set up with the Expo had uh, a guy came down one night and said hey I actually know how to do this there was a guy reading calls out of a book 
you know, and we were playing music to him, and it wasn't working too well, but it was happening. And he said, I really know how to do this. And he said, well, show us. And he grabbed the mic, and he was loaded with all these these uh, enormously wonderful, engaging, rhyming, singing, patter call things he did. It just revitalized all our interest in it. We came back to Seattle and started dancing in the taverns. We had had it. We played with the same place that Phil and Vivian played down on First Avenue. And we'd sometimes get as many people in there listening to us as there were in our band. And that was a, a good <laughs> night. And we'd play four sets of music to a total of nine people and uh, go home feeling pretty good. All of a sudden, we were playing dances, and there were 150 people in there, and we couldn't help but know the difference at the end of the night. You know, we actually were making money, and we started, uh, and, and the whole thing kind of took fire from there. And now you go down one floor and see what's happened. It's like there's hundreds of people down there, and it's, it's wound up back in the hands of the people again, which is really, really sort of the whole issue, actually, is that everyone found they could play for dances, they could dance, they could call, they, you know, it's... It's all of our belonging, you know. It's we all have this thing. And so I f feel terrific to have had the opportunity to sort of move from place to place and all of a sudden have the thing sort of take fire around me. Hundreds and hundreds of people are involved in this having happened. But it's alive and well. Look at the kids out on the corners playing. I mean, uh, so yeah. that's that's how lucky I am. I don't know about you guys. Do you want to call John's fiddle and No, it's okay. I'll, I'll just sit up here. So, we're a little ahead of schedule, which is great. Yeah. So we can play a couple more tunes. Good, do that. Yay. And then we can take some questions. Well, we had Honest John. Honest John. Okay, we had our list of uh, spares. Yeah. You want to play? All right. Okay, we're so gonna, while, while John White here from uh, Missouri is getting his fiddle ready to join the jam, we're going to play a Canadian tune. Called, I, I don't know if it's Canadian. I guess it is called yeah. Honest John. I mentioned it, uh, this, I've seen this tune carved up in the old, uh, a lot of the old square dance books, and it's uh, one that Cappy Kappenman, a caller we've worked with, uh, he's been calling around here since the late 40s and 50s and called for some just huge dances back in that era. Um, uh, on Lake Union, they had the uh, aqua barn, a floating barge, and they just bring in hundreds of dancers at a time. Um, anyway, uh, Honest John is one he always requests. So. Because we're at Folklife, there's lots of musicians around, and some of them actually remember to bring their fiddles with them, <laughs> which Warren somehow did not. <laughs> so John White is from Missouri, and he's been playing this music around Missouri for as long as Phil and Vivian, I guess, maybe longer. And you can use this one. I'll talk a bit. Oh yeah, we could actually move that one. I can't talk. There's no sound. So we're going to take a couple of minutes to get set up, and Vivian, I guess, will tell you about this tune. Okay, so actually, Phil has been quiet for too long. He needs to say something. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, we, we brought John. Uh, John, I wanted to bring John up here for a reason. 
and that's that uh, years and years ago when Vivian and I started re uh, wondering where, why it was, we'd go out to jam sessions all over the West, and there was no question of style. Everybody knew all these tunes, and we knew them. We'd known them since we were kids. And there was no question whatsoever as to the style they were being played in or the, what they were. Everybody knew them, and they all played basically the same way in the or northern compatible, compatible ways. ways. And so we wondered about this, and it wasn't until we started doing a lot of research on uh, where the music came from in the Pacific Northwest, the fiddling, and found out, of course, no surprise, that it came out over the Oregon Trail, that a bunch of connections started to be made. And in 19, what was it, 98, I think, was we met Howard. 99. 99. We met uh, Dr. Howard Marshall from Missouri down at the, at the American Folklore Society Convention, where we were doing a paper, delivering a paper on the Western uh, Fiddle Association movement. And, uh, you know, we sat down, and uh, Vivian and, and uh, Howard sat down and started playing together. And they realized they knew all these tunes together, and they played extremely compatible styles. And Vivian and Stuart and I have talked this over for quite a while, and we realized that the style, there is a Northwest style, and that style was a synthesis of a bunch of things, that people that came out from all over the world. It's the most eclectic style in the United States. They played more different tunes, more different ways than any part of the country. And uh, we realized that the style basically came out of on the Oregon Trail, which started in Missouri. And that the Missouri fiddling styles, there are about six styles there, but those styles were a heavy influence in the, in the style of Northwest fiddling and the, from the surrounding states, Tennessee and uh, uh, Kentucky and uh, uh, Ohio, Illinois, those are the Great Lakes states. That's where things came from. So we have John White here, great fiddler from Missouri, and I thought we should play a tune, uh, a Missouri tune, and uh, you will see what this compatibility is all about. huh? Because Vivian and Stuart learned that here, and of course John learned it back in Missouri. What are we going to play? Are we going to play Marmadukes? Marmadukes? Okay. What How else? about that? Is okay. there any other tune? <laughs> so what John do you know has a little this? different version. Do you want him to play his first yeah, and then you guys first. join in? Yeah, you play first and then we'll mess you up. I guess my version is Missouri version because I learned it from a Missouri filler, but uh, he was a great filler named Jake Hockamar, and uh, yeah. he had his own version of Marmaduke's Hornpipe, and he won all the contests around there, so everybody tried to copy after him. So uh, uh, he, more or less, he more or less wrote Marmaduke's Hornpipe for us as far as we're concerned down there. The Missouri National Anthem, right? I guess. Oh my fingers. Oh, here we go. By the way, I'm playing my daughter's fiddle. Mine's being worked on, so I'm, we're going to see what happens. Thank you. 
Okay, Northwest All Time Fiddling. Doesn't get any better than that. So just to let you know, um, before we move into questions, that there's plenty of opportunities for you to hear this music on your um, electronic machinery. Phil and Vivian have oodles and oodles of recordings. They have some of them in the store. They are Voyager Records, Voyager Recording Online. The Washington All Time Fiddlers Association has been collecting some of the older music from the older fiddlers and issuing it on um, CDs. A lot of them are tune books, so there's a tune book with the tunes written out and then the CD so you can listen to the music as well. And I, I mentioned that series is now available on, online too. You just go to the Washington All Time Fiddlers website and look for Tune of the Month and you'll have a recording and a what? recording and the transcription and the uh, comments by Sage what Wisdom what, about what the tune. And John White has a recording out on our label. Go to Voyage. This is the commercial time. VoyagerRecords.com. Okay, we're going to play one more short one because there's a bunch of musicians up here and they want to play music. So what are you going to play? I don't know. <laughs> Mississippi Sawyer? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mississippi okay. Sawyer. Mississippi Sawyer. Everybody knows Mississippi Sawyer. What? Time for some questions if you want to ask some questions. He's been here uh, in a few years, I don't know, about 10 years ago. So I don't, you probably didn't hear the question, which was can we get Pete Seeger out to folk life? He's um, been here. But he was actually my inspiration to play the banjo, to start playing the banjo in 1954. Okay. We should try to get him again. I think his health is a little <laughs> fragile, so it might be problematic. But it's worth a try. Any other questions? You know, questions, we could play another tune. We have time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. More music. What a waltz. Something different. My mind is blank. We already did Peek of the Wild. That. We already did that. Yeah. What do you think of? Or, uh... Come on, you guys. you got to hear the thinkers. Huh? They know so many tunes, it's hard to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll think of one after we're done. Yeah. yeah. Think of what, you know what John plays. Play one of the ones off of your records. Play one of the ones off of your CD. Oh, uh, Time's moving on, yeah, we folks. play a uh, real simple one, be nobody darn it but mine. And you know that one? And G, I play G. Go for it. Well, it's more fun to hear the tune. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I guess then we'll play a tune that the name's longer than the song called Be, no, be Nobody's Darling But Mine. Okay. What G. G. Is that all right? 
in front of you, what you're part of is living history because I don't know if you noticed that uh, Stuart and Vivian obviously don't know that tune, but they were doing a wonderful job of faking it, which is what you do. And then, you know, suddenly you have a new tune out of faking it. And it has been my great privilege to be part of the Washington Old Time Fiddlers Association and hang out and learn from the older fiddlers here and be part of this history of this state, which I have thoroughly enjoyed. My name is Breege. I'm from Ireland. <laughs> But I've had a great time here with the old-time fiddlers, and I'm going to suggest that we finish up with a real quick run through Flop-Eared Mule, which I'm sure you do not know is Washington State's tune. It's the, was it's the theme tune of the um, Old-Time Fiddlers Association, the Washington State Old-Time Fiddlers Association. So we have... Yeah, so a couple times through. We have two minutes, so... He does a hoedown. The Washington fiddlers usually do it as a shottish. So, uh, are we going to do it that? All right, once through as a shottish, and then we'll convert it into a hoedown. Because it works great both ways.
uh, that's all we have time for. Thanks to Jens and thanks to Glenn, the sound guy. Thanks to you all for coming out. Thanks to Doug for videotaping. And um, we'll see you all next year. <laughs>